Good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Uh, so great to be with everybody this morning. For those of you I have not had the opportunity of meeting, my name is David Babb. I am an associate pastor at the River Eureka and have been bringing you your Tuesday devotionals. Uh, Pastor Tim does Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. My incredible, amazing, wonderful wife, Jenny, has been doing Thursdays, and I do uh, the Tuesdays. Um, what's nice about these is they're live every morning at 8 during the week, and which is great, but obviously because they're uh, posted on Facebook, uh, we're also going to be putting them on YouTube as well. You can watch them whenever convenient. Um, it's also nice you can look back at the ones that you missed and rewatch those to kind of stay up to date or share them with folks that you think might need uh, the love of God or the message of Christ during, during what's going on. Um, last week, I introduced you to the Apostle John. I would recommend if you have not watched that devotionals last Tuesday that you look it up. Uh, a little bit of a biography. I, I'm a big believer that in order to understand the message better, it's always a good idea to understand a little bit more about the messenger. Uh, John is the fourth gospel and very different from the other gospel accounts. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar to each other, and that's why we refer to them as the synoptic gospels. And some ask, you know, why a fourth gospel? And this is getting repetitive, right? And I think the best answer that I've ever heard was spoken by a very, very early Christian in the first century. He was a Christian writer, and um, he gave the great answer. He said, I, didn't, I don't believe that there are four Gospels. He said, I believe that there is one fourfold Gospel. And the reason that he said that is because all four of them have some significant differences as it relates to telling us about the person of Jesus Christ. For example, Matthew, which of course is written mostly to a Jewish audience, emphasizes Jesus as the Messiah, the one that was foretold, uh, the one that was prophesied and he'd be coming and was going to be the Jewish Messiah. Mark was written to the Romans and reveals Jesus as a servant. I mean, over and over again in Mark, you see Jesus talking about how the Son of Man came not to serve, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life. And, and Mark likes to depict Jesus as taking off his garment and wrapping around his waist and washing the feet of the other disciples. Uh, we see this big emphasis in Mark as Christ as a servant. Luke was written to the Greeks, and he likes to show Jesus as the perfect man. See, this perfect, glorified man. And then in John, we're going to see this together, that he very clearly wants to declare Jesus Christ as God. And so what a beautiful, rounded picture we get of Messiah, servant, perfect man, and God. And when we get to the Gospel of John, it seems as though he's not writing to the Jews or to the Romans or to the Greeks. It's as though the audience is the entire world. And it presents Jesus probably in the fullest of his own character. It speaks of him as the Son of God, in fact, as God himself, as God in a human body, God in human flesh. And you'll also notice that John goes back in his gene genealogy in verse 1 all the way back further than Matthew, further than Mark, further than Luke, to the very beginning itself. Like the book of Genesis type of beginning. Um, John verse one, chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that had been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. It's the word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So let's go through John. Let's go through the Gospel of John concept by concept. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it sounds like he's speaking about an inanimate object, right? Um, like a piece of conversation, a word. But he says, he, the word, he was in the beginning with God. So Matthew begins the genealogy with, of Jesus with Abraham. Um, Luke decides to take it even further all the way back to Adam. And that's about as far back as you can get, you would think, right? But John actually goes a huge step further, taking it all the way back to the very, very beginning. 
The point being is Jesus never wasn't. He always was. In the beginning, sounds like Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, right? In the beginning was the Word. But it sounds strange to be talking about a human being, a person, an entity. Uh, as an entity with a human body, a personality, and to call that personality by the term Word. It sounds kind of mystical and ethereal, right? Philosophical. So what's with Jesus being called the Word? Well, see, the Jews would sometimes refer to God as the Word. The Hebrew word is memra, and the, and the Greek word is logos, and, and that's because the Jewish people have such a high respect for God that they would never use his given name from the Old Testament, Yahweh. They wouldn't say Yahweh said or Yahweh did. It was this perfect, holy name. They would either say Adonai or simply Hashem, which means the name, or sometimes in their writings like the Targums, which are commentaries on the Old Testament scriptures, they would use the word memra or the word as a designation of God himself. So it was familiar at that time. It was familiar among the Jews. If you were to say the word, they would think that you mean God. But also in that day and age, among the Greeks, they believed in what they called logos, or the word. And that term was used by Greek philosophers. You see, the Greeks understood that the world in which we live has a level of design. They believed it must be because there was a first principle, an ordering principle that they called the Logos. The reason for the order in the universe, according to Greek philosophers, is because there existed a Logos, the Word. So appealing to Jewish listeners and appealing to Greek listeners, remember, he's writing to the entire world. In the beginning was the Logos, the ordering principle, the first cause, God himself. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus created all things. He is the creator. He is the source of life. He comes to earth, but he is the source and the origin of life in the beginning. Every now and then, uh, science likes to ask a logical question, and, and I actually appreciate the question. And, and, and the question is, if given enough time, can natural processes be responsible for animate, intelligent life? Now, I'm kind of a history nerd. In fact, I just heard a huge nerd in general about stuff like this. And I spent months studying this as I kind of started down this path of ministry. And what's interesting about this, a few years ago, the Wistar Institute assembled 50 mathematical, mathematicians and biologists for a summer to analyze that very question. And in their concluding statement, based on our understanding of the laws of chemistry and physics and what we know as mathematical randomness, there is no way that the complexity of life could just come about, end quote. Now, the report goes on to say, for randomness to be responsible for life is a mathematical impossibility. No matter how old you think the universe is, there's just not enough time, by all current models, for randomness to be responsible for it. See, John is telling us what happened. All things were made through him, through Jesus. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Jesus is the source of life. And it's also important to understand that when the Bible speaks of life, it speaks of three different kinds of life. And most people don't realize that, and they think life is just biological, biological life, and, and the Bible does refer to that, but very sparingly. And so there's three words, right? The first is the word bios, like biology. It means physical, biological life, heart pumping, lungs breathing, that's bios. And what's interesting is in the New Testament, though it speaks of bios and it uses it, it almost uses it almost as a backhanded negative. Uh, Jesus spoke about the thorns that choke out the life of the seed, the biological life. There's a second usage of the term and that of the Greek New Testament, and that's the word psuche, or what we would call psyche which sounds a lot like psychology. And that's where we get our term psychology, and it means the inner you, the inner satisfaction. 
Jesus says, if you want to save your life, your pasuke, you have to surrender your life. The answer to finding peace of mind and peace of soul is surrendering it to Jesus. But then there's the third use of it. And by far, it takes the lion's share of all the usages from the Greek New Testament into English, that translation, and that's the Greek word zoe. Now, zoe is a theological term that speaks of the quality of life that comes from God. It will last forever. But even more than just going on and on, it's a quality of life that begins now and continues through all of eternity. New life, new zoe, is a result of new birth. Birth brings life. So you must be born again. And when you are born again, you get zoe, a quality of life that lasts forever. So in him was life. He is the origin of biological life. He is also the source of inner satisfaction and psych psychological life. But he's also the giver of everlasting life, eternal life, abundant life that goes on and on and on. And verse 5 was a verse that I found the most fascinating, and one of the most in the beginning here. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And it's translated lots of different ways, and maybe that's why I find it interesting. Uh, sometimes it says, and the darkness did not overcome it. Now, uh, the darkness did not apprehend it or comprehend it. And look at it this way. A fog has settled upon the earth. So everywhere you look, it's that cold, wintry fog. And Jesus Christ comes along. And it's like he's the flashlight, the fog light, and it dispels or moves the fog. I love the word picture. If you've never heard it, uh, Hillsong uh, has an awesome song called There's Another in the Fire. Um, Scott and the Praise Band sing it. It's amazing. He says, there's another in the fire. I can see the light in the darkness, and the darkness bows to him. <clears throat> I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between wears thin. I can feel the ground shake beneath, beneath us as the prison walls cave in, and nothing stands between us. And to that point, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shined in the darkness. The darkness did not comprehend, apprehend, overcome it. So as we go about our Tuesday, the rest of our week, as we wring our hands over the chaos in the world, the constant and continuous onslaught of negative Im images that we're bombarded with on the news, on social media. I mean, we marvel at the level of anger and hate and lack of reason or lack of humanity that we're seeing right now. We, we let such a small, infinitesimal, noisy group of people sensationalize everything and stir us all up, right? Consider the opening of John. See, we picture Jesus as human. Long hair, robe, flowing robe and sandals. And human he was. But sometimes we forget he was there at the beginning. The beginning of everything. He never wasn't. Hard to wrap your mind around. I mean, for me, it's like standing next to the ocean, right? My problems just, I mean, they just seem silly. And small all of a sudden. The same can be said about the problems of this world. They just seem, I mean, well, compared to the creator of everything, the agitators just look a little foolish, don't they? This week, let's turn off the noise and open up the book of John together. Now, it might not have a ticker running across the bottom or a catchy slogan, and, and it certainly doesn't have these powerful noises and bright colors alerting us to minute by minute by minute breaking stories. Disaster after disaster, end of the world. But it does have something that the noise doesn't usually have. The truth. The message of love and the message of hope. Let us pray. Dear, magnificent, amazing Lord God, we thank you so much for the book of John. We thank you for John himself and what he went through to bring it to us. We ask this week, Lord, that you help us understand that you were there from the beginning and that we can take great comfort in knowing that the issues and problems and, and the things of this world are, are just they're temporary. They're, they're so small compared to the universe, so small compared to your glory. 
Lord, we ask for a great Tuesday and a great rest of our week. We thank you, God, for giving us so much to be so grateful for. And we love you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everybody, we're going to staying on John. So again, if you missed last week a little bit about but John's past, I would jump into that and rewatch it. And then next week, we're going to move into John the Baptist, and um, we're going to continue from John 1. Uh, everybody have an amazing week. Peace be with, be with all of you. I love you guys, and I'll see you next Tuesday.